Okay, so we're back again with another great talk uh, towards a sustainable solution to open source sustainability. Uh, the speaker today is Toby, and he is the founder of Unlock Open, a firm that helps large organizations build a strong open source culture with clients such as Google, Mozilla, and Intel. He's also the facilitator of AMP's advisory committee, a uh, member of the OpenJS Foundation, and on the advisory council of Oasis Open Projects. He is known for having co-maintained the prototype JavaScript framework. He's also edited a number of web standards. Uh, so we have a great speaker here with us today. Over to you, Toby. Well, thank you very much. Uh, can you all hear me? It, it, it sounds like uh, so. Um, well, um, thank you for having me today. Uh, I just... Um, had a power cycle issue and just literally got back on time to do the talk. So if I'm a bit out of breath, that's going to cool as the talk uh, goes in. Um, so today I want to talk to you about um, the question of open source sustainability. And for this, um, I want to start with um, something that happened um, now uh, a while ago. I don't know if any of you uh, are familiar um, with uh, this logo here. Um, that is the logo for the Heartbleed bug. And what is the Heartbleed bug? Well, it's, um, it was a critical vulnerability that affected the OpenSSL library in 2014. And um, what was really important about this bug was the fact that uh, because the OpenSSL library is responsible for something really important, securing network communications in Unix systems, and because Unix systems are ubiquitous, um, OpenSSL uh, and that vulnerability um, essentially impacted roughly about two thirds of the web. Um, and uh, the, the, the outcome of uh, that bug was, for example, like a, a number of really um, large issues. It is, the estimate cost to the industry was about half a billion dollars. And it had some really bad impact. For example, and that's just only one example, four and a half million um, medical records of US patients um, were compromised. Um, so the reason I'm, I'm talking about this particular bug, bug today, it's because it's a pivotal moment where the tech industry suddenly realized that OpenSSL, this uh, critical library, uh, was an open source library that everyone was relying on and, well, two-thirds of active sites were relying on, and that it was an open source library and that it was critically underfunded. Uh, this really important piece of software essentially had one full-time maintainer and was um, really had this tiny budget on which it was functioning, which was roughly $2,000 a year. So when you think about the amount of transactions and um, um, really important communications that go on uh, across OpenSSL, and that's, it seems to be like this huge discrepancy here. And that kind of triggered a moment where the industry really realized um, how uh, underfunded and how uh, unsustainable this whole infrastructure on, on top of which um, so many things today are built actually was. Um, and that's when we really started uh, hearing about the problem of uh, open source maintainer burnout. Um, and uh, the, really that really raised um, the, and, and put a spotlight on the question of open source sustainability. And we really started um, seeing the community sort of talk about these issues uh, more broadly in the industry really uh, consider them seriously. And so um, this triggered a number of responses. And what I'm gonna do in this first part of the talk is actually uh, discuss some of those. Um, so one of them, the first thing that happened really quickly is the core infrastructure initi initiative. And this was an industry-wide effort led by the Linux Foundation and backed by some of the largest um, you know, players in, in the tech field and it had a multi-million dollar fund that was administered by the Linux Foundation and a steering committee of industry security experts. And the goal was really to make sure that we wouldn't ever again have to deal with something like the heartbleed bug. And so really define, um, clarify what the core infrastructure of the internet uh, was in terms of open source projects and make sure that they had um, the necessary funds and resources 
to uh, operate in a, sustain in, a, in a sustainable way. Um, what's important to notice here, however, is that uh, this infrastructure was really focused on, I mean, sorry, this effort was really focused on core infrastructure. And as we all know, open source is way, way broader than just um, a few important libraries that are everywhere. And so and now that the floodgates were open, uh, uh, people and the community and the maintainers and contributors were still um, uh, had still a strong desire to solve that problem, not just for a subset of libraries that were everywhere, but um, uh, more generally from a, a more systemic perspective, if you will. And so uh, we started seeing a lot of experimentation. Here um, you see Evan Yu, who uh, is one of the first open source developers who um, relied on Patreon, uh, um, a, a solution originally designed for artists, musicians, and writers to create for himself a revenue so that he could be able to work on Vue.js. And um, because sustainability is often a question of, of essentially resources, you'll see that in this talk, we're going to talk a lot of money. I know this is unusual in the engineering and, and developer space, but um, I, I think it's really critical to start building that perspective of how open source interacts with resources, um, how it creates value and who captures that value. And so that's why you'll see a lot of uh, a lot of um, really talking about dollar dollar amounts. So um, he was able to uh, make roughly seventeen thousand dollars a month um, through that system, um, which um, is uh, a really decent uh, um, uh, amount of money to to build a sustainable self-owned business, um, and. Um, you know, the, the question is like, is this reproducible? And it feels like there aren't that many cases of individuals having been able to uh, create such a system for themselves that is sustainable. Um, we saw lots of um, other um, uh, efforts of that similar nature. Uh, uh, Gitcoin is one interesting uh, such uh, example. So it was essentially uh, an, an originally an issue market um, where you could, uh, what, what the idea was to be able to um, make it easy for people to come and uh, contribute to a project and get money uh, instead uh, for for their work, right? So you would have uh, open an issue, add a bounty to that issue, and then um, people would come. You would um, help them uh, figure out what the issue was exactly. Um, they would solve the problem. Um, you would the, the pro cross would be merged and they would be paid. So that was blockchain based and it was um, there was a reasonable amount of money that was um, sort of exchanged on that platform in 2018. I don't know the, the later the latest numbers, but I don't think it has dramatically dramatically picked up. Uh, but yeah, it's still this decent amount of money. Um, and what's interesting with Gitcoin is that it's a whole ecosystem. Uh, there was an ad network that now uh, has disappeared, and also there's a Patreon like solution called Grants. So um, CodeFund was um, uh, an ad network uh, designed to help open source maintainers make money by advertising, creating contextual privacy focused ads um, on readmes or on the um, uh, project's uh, uh, web pages, really focused on hiring developers. So that could be privacy aware because you didn't really need to track people. Um, and that had a roughly um, uh, $6,000 per month uh, revenue distributed to maintainers out of um, uh, $10,000 uh, that were uh, made. Um, it's being closed and uh, CodeFund now suggests people instead go rely on ethical ads, which is doing something fairly similar and has a similar origin story, which was really to fund sustainable open source development. Um, and they've served a lot of ads. Uh, we don't have details on how much money that is, but um, it's also a, so, sort of an interesting way to, to attempt to make open source development sustainable. We've also seen a lot of uh, VC interest, and increasingly so. Um, a big fund is OSS Capital, um, and there is uh, increasingly considerations uh, of um, uh, open source software as um, venues to build um, um, businesses uh, on top of. Um, but of course, that doesn't address the, the whole set of um, open source and the sort of the different um, 
types of open source projects and, and, and people involved. Uh, we've seen numero, numerous crypto-based solutions too. That's really, there's a lot of interest right now in, in trying to uh, somehow have uh, coins attached to uh, commits. Um, and and, and there's, there's a lot of work going on. I, there, there's nothing really specific uh, or particularly successful that we can point to. Some people have even suggested using NFTs for that kind of stuff. So th there's work in that space. Um, um, nothing really highly conclusive for now, but it's certainly something that we want to pay attention to. Of course, um, Open Collective um, has been doing a lot of very successful work in this space. What is Open Collective? Well, it essentially provides a uh, nonprofit status to open source projects, uh, which they don't have otherwise, and that helps them, um, makes it easier for them to be able to receive money and, and share that money. So there's real success stories um, in for Open Collective. For example, Webpack has been uh, making substantial amounts of money from it for a long time. Uh, but as most of these solutions, there's really a long tail uh, problem, which is that the bigger projects get all of the money um, and the smaller ones really get crumbs. And so because we have all of these dependencies, um, open source um, uh, uh, projects that are more underlying libraries tend not to really be easy to fund. And so that's um, a problem. And that um, is a problem that Open Collective has been trying to address with Back Your Stack which essentially helps organizations and even open source projects themselves to identify not only their open source dependencies, but the dependencies of, this, of, their, uh, of these dependencies. And as a result, sort of try to fund the whole um, a tree uh, of a uh, node tree of dependencies that they have. Um, so, so that's an effort in that direction. And there is something similar that is being uh, attempted by Tidelift, uh, which is um, trying to create bring Red Hat's business model, but for this long tail. And the idea here is that it provides um, the kind of security and peace of mind in terms of security and compliance to um, uh, organize, to companies building on top of open source software um, for a fee and it uses the money that it receives um, to fund itself, obviously, but also to pay the maintainers to actually be uh, maintaining the projects um, and making sure that they stay secure and stay up to date. Uh, well, we've seen also GitHub sponsors uh, more recently uh, take off. Um, and so, so there's a lot of things happening in the industry quite clearly to try to help this problem. Um, and now I, that I've talked about all of the exciting things, I also want to uh, start giving a broader perspective and really um, sort of ask the fundamental, fundamental question of like, is this really, are we moving towards a sustainable solution to open source sustainability? Um, and so, as you can see from this, like that there is, uh, yes, to some degree, but we're like uh, very, like these are the very first steps in the long journey. So, um, here are four key limitations of addressing open source sustainability through this notion of helping to fund open source projects, right? So, the first question is, does it scale? Um, uh, the second question is, well, is really money what's missing from these projects? Um, the third question is, well, even if that solution scales and money is missing, is this a desirable outcome? Like, is this idea of having corporations build proprietary software on one end and sort of fund open source software on the other and have this real split between developers writing sort of glue code in proprietary systems and open source developers building like critical infrastructure on the other, a good solution. And then the last thing I want to touch upon is what is the real value of open source and um, uh, um, isn't it time for us to stop just considering the software itself and look at the broader, have a, a broader perspective on, on the value of open source? So let's start with does it scale? And for this, I'm going to use a set of um, um, picture, uh, well, diagrams really that come from a democracy that he that was allowed to use. So, um, you know, this is a hundred um, dollar bill, right? And so when you put a hundred dollar, a hundred, times a $100 bill together, it makes this nice little 
stack of, of dollar bills. And uh, that's $10,000, and that corresponds to roughly the monthly revenue of um, Code Fund, the um, ad solution that I've talked to earlier on. Now, if you take 100 of those, you get a million dollars, right? And this was, so I, some of that data is a bit um, 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 old at this point, but this was the amount of money um, spent, uh, well, collected by Open, Collect by Open Collective in 2018, I think. It's more today, but not that much more. Um, and um, um, it's the amount that Tidelift uh, committed to pay developers from the funding it received. That's a million dollars. So um, let's quickly jump to look at what the worldwide developer population looks like and, and try to do a comparison here between how big um, uh, uh, developing and, and, and uh, software development in the world is compared to how much money we're trying to uh, fund open source was. So uh, that data from the worldwide developer census in 2018 shows that there's roughly um, 20 million uh, developers in the world, um, uh, about half of which are full-time and about a quarter of which are part-time and then uh, another quarter, roughly speaking, is, um, are, are non-professionals. So let's do a quick back-of-the-envelope math here to get a sense of the overall market. So if we look at 12 million full-time developers and give them a $65,000 average uh, cost for a year, that's really low for like Silicon Valley, really high for other parts of the world. This is really back of the envelope math, so bear with me. Right? That's, um, it creates a yearly sort of cost to the industry of uh, $780 billion, right? Now, if you add to that about 6 million part-time developers, estimate the cost of those at uh, $35,000 a year, that adds another $210 billion, which makes a total of $1 trillion spent by the industry um, yearly on um, um, developers, essentially, building software. So, going back to uh, $1 million, let's look at what $1 trillion is going to look like. Put 100 of those stacks together, you have like this nice crate with $100 million of those. Get 10 of those together, that is $1 billion, right? Now, if you put 100 of those crates together, you get $10 billion. And you can see for scale the truck and the, the little person down there. And in order to move to $1 trillion, you will have to stack 100 of those together, right? And that is what a trillion dollar looks like. So this is roughly the amount of money that the industry spends on engineers building code on a yearly basis, right? And when we're talking about funding of open source, you can look at that tiny person down uh, that skyscraper, that money skyscraper, and um, that is um, uh, that is that small stack here is a million dollar. So we're roughly talking about spending, you know, five, ten, maybe even twenty of those million dollars. And so there's this massive discrepancy that we can't not acknowledge. Okay, so secondly, uh, is money what's even missing? And so if you look at uh, developers working on open source software, what you realize, and that depends on the kind of projects, but there are projects that we have really good data for. Uh, here is the Linux kernel, sort of an outsider in that space, but it's really important to notice that 93% of contributors in 2016 were actually employed to work on this project. So. Uh, you know, by throwing money at developers, are we actually really, um, uh, really solving the problem here? Um, uh, it's not so sure, right? Um, okay, so, um, you know, we're not spending enough money, clearly. We're not sure that money is actually the right um, solution to that problem. Um, uh, let's look at, you know, whether this is actually a desirable outcome um, um, you know, for the space or not. And so I want to actually quote here um, something, uh, a quote by David um, uh, DHH that is uh, a number of uh, years old at this point, um, and um, uh, which I, I think is gives an interesting perspective on uh, 
considerations that we should have here, despite some of the, the latest um, issues that um, um, have has happened in, in the space with uh, some of what um, VHH and, and, and Basecamp have been uh, going on with. I'm probably going to remove this slide in the, in, in the future, so uh, apologies for it being here today. Um, but I think that the quote still stands as something that's important, which is that part of the, he says, part of the reason much of open source is so good and often so superior to closed source commercial projects is the natural boundaries of constraints. If you're not being paid or otherwise comp compensated directly for your work, you're less likely to needlessly embellish it. You're solving the problems for you and your mates. I see here's a problematic term, uh, likely in the simplest way you could, so you can get back to whatever you originally intended to do before starting to shave the yak. And what's interesting here to me is this notion that open source is really good when the people building it are actually building tools that they need to solve the problems that they are uh, facing right now, and that it is better to have this back and forth of engineers working on the specific problems and on open source parts uh, to solve parts of those problems, rather than really split up. I have open source developers on one side and um, um, commercial developers on the other. Um, so um, the last thing I really want to touch on is what is the real value of open source? Um, and if you ask uh, what the value of open source is to people in general and corporations in particular, um, you will um, have the answer that it is the code itself. And so the, ten, the idea is essentially like uh, corporations use open source, uh, they you know, use open source that's in the pool of commons, and then uh, they fund open source by essentially giving money or throwing money at the problem, right? Was the hope that then all of these developers that receive money are going to continue contributing to the commons. Um, and so the perceived value is really uh, the code. In reality, what we know about open source and what everyone who is involved in open source projects is fairly familiar with is that a lot of value comes actually not so much from the code itself, but from the practice of building that code and from the interactions, uh, the confrontation of uh, different uh, requirements, different needs, different cultures, different use cases that come from working together on a broad, with a broad set of engineers on this, uh, this problem. And so really a lot of the value is uh, in uh, helping those engineers um, that are participating in open source grow, um, learn from each other. And there's a lot of data today that, that really backs up the fact that um, working in open source is actually highly beneficial for engineers in terms of both like their technical skills, but also their soft skills, the network and their ability and their career essentially. I um, mean, so right now what happens is all of this value goes uh, away and is not really captured by the, the, those corporations that are actually hoping to do so. Um, and it goes away with, well, it goes to the developers, the open source developers that are involved, right? But corporations are actually not uh, these like entities, separate entities. They are full of engineers themselves, right? And um, if we start getting these engineers to contribute to this pool of commons, like we saw in, with the Linux kernel before, um, uh, they start getting these interactions with the broader community, and they start benefiting growing from that and bringing that, that value back to their corporations. And I think really the key to open source sustainability is not just throwing money at the problem, is making sure that the industry, the broad industry, understands that there is a lot of value for them uh, as organizations, as companies working in that space to actively participate in open source and benefit from having um, building those networks, building that reputation in the field, becoming more attractive to other de to developers uh, and essentially leveling up their engineers as a result. Right. So um, really Again, charity-like funding alone is not the solution. The real way forward is to normalize engineers contributing to open source as part of their day job. And the question to how well, again, is to make organizations really understand the return on investment of contributing to open source. And that um, concludes um, this talk. Uh, I think we have a few minutes. Uh, I don't know if we can take questions, but I'd love to do that if that was the case.
Hi, Toby. Um, so we do not have any questions right now. However, the audience does have a lot of remarks on the talk. Like, I think everyone found it pretty engaging. Uh, if there are questions, we can wait uh, right now. Uh, and I will post the questions here if they show up. Uh, otherwise, I think the audience and you can like chat in the breakout room. That sounds great. Um, yeah, I'm fine with both. And um, um, I mean, happy to wait a couple of seconds if there is a question. And if not, um, really, I'll, I'll let you handle this as you want. Oh, okay. I, I saw yeah, one no. question. Um, no. That was me not editing it. But yeah, we do have a question. Right. Um, let me just bring it up here. And then, OK, so someone's asking, what's the best way to start with your first contribution? That is a great question, actually. Um, to go back to this point I was trying to make in the middle that um, there is a lot of value in bridging the, the work that you're doing for you, the, the application that you're working on and open source. I think the best way to start your first, first contribution is actually to go solve a real problem that you have with an open source library that you're relying on um, and to build uh, whatever it is that you're building for your work or for yourself. So really, really link that first contribution to your work rather than have this completely split story where you're working your work on one side and on the other you try to find a first a good first issue in a project so really for me like anchoring this in your actual day-to-day -day work and sort of creating fuzzing the the frontier between what is work and what is open source and making sure that you you're able to move from one to the other is really the best way to get in this kind of like the right mindset and the right culture. So that's what I would recommend. Of course, that's not always possible to do. Um, and if that's not possible, I would suggest finding a project that um, is closely related to something that you care about um, and then seeing if that project is welcoming uh, and welcomes new contributors and then uh, attempting to solve a really simple problem. And to tell a quick personal story here, I started in open source uh, now, like close to two decades ago, because I loved um, a, a JavaScript project uh, called the Prototype JavaScript Framework, and I there was no documentation for it, and I didn't know how to code JavaScript. I didn't know how to do software development at all, and so what I did was look at the code and started documenting it, and by doing that, I learned how to code really. I shared that documentation that created value and really sort of like created, started my career in open source. So it's not only code contributions that are valuable, it's just way broader than that. And it really is about focusing on something that is achievable for you, lightweight and brings value. Uh, okay, so thank you for that answer. We have another question that has been asked by many of our viewers, and we do have a minute to take it. So let's have a try. How uh -huh. do I convince my boss? <laughs> Let me work on OS. Yeah. Um, that's the biggest problem. Um, again, I would start with small steps. Um, try to identify one place where um, Doing so would actually create value for the company. Um, maybe you're maintaining a fork of something because there's like a tiny feature that you need on top of it. Um, try to explain how much easier it would be and how much easier it would be to keep that fork up to date and secure if you just um, upstream that little um, bug. Uh, start small, small steps, and and you know really build from small steps and and try to 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 grow from there. Okay, thank you so much. You're uh, welcome. It's been a great talk, uh, and the audience has loved it. So yeah, it's... wonderful. Well, I'm happy to take more questions in in the in the, in the chat in the breakout room. Yeah, yeah, in the breakout. Absolutely. Thank you so much.